So this is the fourth class of the uh, series on the uh, boom and bust cycle, how real estate is connected to the real estate cycle. So we'll talk today about uh, money, interest rates, and the cycle. So uh, <clears throat> first of all, what is money? How is money defined? Well, money is commonly defined as a medium of exchange, a medium of exchange. But uh, when you buy stuff with a check, the check is also a medium of exchange. So money has to have some other attribute besides being a medium of exchange. And that is money is the final means of payment. So the final means of payment is what you want to end up with. So when you buy with a check, Right? It's a medium of exchange, but the seller doesn't want to end up with a check. He wants to end up with funds in his bank account. So he deposits that check. So the final means of payment is the either currency or the deposits in his bank account. And so that's how so money is a medium of exchange and the final means of payment. All right, so what about interest? Uh, why is the interest rate not zero? Can anybody tell me? I can, uh, let's see. I can't see most of you. I, I basically see names and not persons. Uh, so I guess, uh, I guess, so I'll answer the question. Why is there a positive rate of interest? The market rate of interest originates in what's called time preference which is a general tendency of people to prefer to have goods sooner rather than later. Think of it this way. Suppose you had some, somebody gave you $30,000 that you could spend now, but you couldn't save it, at least not at interest. You could either spend the $30,000 now, or you could uh, spend $30,000 in 30 years, $10,000 in 30 years, say. So which, which would you rather have, $10,000 now or $10,000 30 years from now and we'll adjust it for inflation so it has the same purchasing power? Well, when I ask the question in the class, in person class, then uh, most people say I'd rather have it now. And so that's uh, due to time preference, P the tendency of people to want things sooner rather than later. And the reason is there's two reasons. One is the limited lifespan. So we, you know, we don't live forever. And secondly, the uncertainty of the future that makes us want to have things now because we know our circumstances today. We don't know our circumstances 20, 30 years from now. And I do have a and question. So that time preference uh, generates a value of goods in which goods have more value if we can have them now than if we pay for them now, but we can't have them until later. And so that decreasing value of goods as we go into the future creates a discount of goods in the future relative to in the present day. And that rate of discount becomes the market rate of interest. Now the interest rate is also set by the market for loanable funds which I'll go into a little later because I'll show you a graph. Loanable funds are funds available to loan out. The supply comes from savings and money creation. The demand comes from borrowing. But whether it's savings or borrowing, right, these are all connected to a time preference. Now, <clears throat> money can be divided into two types real money and money substitutes. Uh, back in the days uh, prior to 1933, when in the United States, gold was uh, the real money, uh, it was also referred to as outside money because the amount of gold is determined outside the banking system. So that was the real money, but you could use banknotes or bank accounts as the more common means of transaction, but a $20 bill was could be converted into a $20 gold coin. So the currency and uh, bank deposit money were money substitutes, right? Convertible into the real money. 
what is the real money today? Since we don't use gold or silver today, the real money is uh, currency. That is paper money and coins is the real money. And the funds in a bank account are money substitutes. When there's a run on the bank, what do people rush to take out? They rush to take out currency because that's the real money upon which the money substitutes are based. Now in today's system, money is created by two entities. One is the Federal Reserve System and the other is the uh, banking system. Now, uh, can somebody tell us or explain to us how the Federal Reserve creates money? Oh, the Federal Reserve creates money by buying bonds. It buys bonds. So how does that create money? Well, suppose you sold the Federal Reserve a $10,000 bond. The Federal Reserve would pay you with a check. So you now have a check from the Federal Reserve. You deposit that into your bank account. And so now the bank has a check from the Fed. So what does the bank do? Well, the bank has its own account with the Federal Reserve banks. The, the Federal Reserve system is divided into 12 regions, each of which has a Federal Reserve bank. In California, the Federal Reserve Bank is located in San Francisco at the end of uh, Market Street. You can visit that building, or at least you used to be able to. So, so the bank would deposit the Fed check into its account with the Federal Reserve. It's the money it has it's a, in its account is called reserves, hence the Federal Reserve System. All right, so, you, so the bank deposits the check and then what does the Federal Reserve Bank do? It covers the check by increasing the balance of the bank's account at the Federal Reserve. And so when it increases the money held by the bank, because the bank deposited the check, that is the creation of money. That is the creation of money out of nothing by the Federal Reserve. But that's not the end of the money creation. The banks then have uh, money to loan out, right? They need to keep a certain amount in their bank and that's called required reserves. The rest they can loan out and that's called excess reserves. And every time a bank loans out money, it creates the money that it loans, right? So every loan is a creation of money so that continues the creation of money. So most of the money creation is from banks loaning out money to uh, borrowers. And when the borrower repays that money, so the money is created when the bank loans it out. When the money is repaid or written off, then that money disappears. So that reduces the money supply. So that's how money is created in our current system. Nowadays, the whole world has a glut of savings. Uh, first of all, the central banks have greatly increased the money supply and that has created a, a lot of money sloshing around in the banking system and in the Federal Reserve. And a lot of people, those who are lucky enough to continue working during the pandemic, a lot of that money is saved. So the savings rate has gone from a few percent to 20, 25% of income being saved by the, those who are able to have an income. And that money also is sitting in the banks. So this uh, glut of savings has generated a very low interest rate, including mortgage interest. Now the interest rate is um, also the capitalization rate or is related to the capitalization rate. The capitalization rate is the multiple of an asset price to the yield of that asset. For example, suppose you have a bond whose purchase price is $100 and it yields 5%. Well, 5% of $100 is $5. But if you divide the $100 price of the bond by the $5 yield, you'll get 20, which is the capitalization rate. And that is important in real estate because uh, property values are 
uh, one way to measure property values is the capitalized rent. You take the rental of that real estate, right, and divide it by the capitalization rate to get the purchase price. Now, when you're buying real estate, uh, what matters is not just the price of the real estate, but your monthly payments. Oh, I got a chat. Okay, from uh, Richard DeMar. But the interest rate paid to the bank during the loan term doesn't disappear when a loan is paid back, right? Yes, the, the interest paid by the borrower is income to the bank and that doesn't disappear because that income is paid periodically. And what happens to that income? Part of it pays for the bank's overhead and profit, and, and the other part goes to pay interest to the depositors. Currently, those interests are very low. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, the bank uses those interests as its income. That's the income of the bank, is the interest payment. That doesn't disappear. And continues the comment, isn't the interest paid back over the term of a mortgage often greater than the mortgage loan itself? Um, well, when you're paying a mortgage, you're paying off the principal, and that's called amortization, and you're paying interest. So, Well, the mortgage loan is like a lump sum amount. It's a stock. It's like, like let's say you borrow uh, $500,000 and then the interest is a percentage of that. So I'm not sure what the question is asking where the interest paid back is greater than the mortgage loan itself. Um, Hi, Fred. Uh, my, my point was just that sometimes I uh, the bank will get back more than the well, more. If you're borrowing a hundred dollars and the interest is five dollars a year, if it's interest only, eventually, yes, the interest paid back would be greater than the loan if you're paying back over a very long period of time. That's that's correct. Okay, thank you. But what did what does disappear is the repayment of the loan entirely to the bank. That create that makes the money disappear. So where was I? Uh, yes, so what matters when you buy real estate is the monthly expense, the mortgage and the utilities and the insurance. Uh, and with mortgage rates very low nowadays around say two, two and a half percent, uh, that's a very low monthly payment. And that, that makes real estate affordable nowadays. So, uh, one of the subsidies I talked about previously is the financial subsidy to real estate because of cheap credit. The artificially cheap credit created by the central bank uh, makes it cheap to buy real estate as well as other kinds of assets if you borrow money. Um, and But it's a subsidy because the interest rates currently used for transactions is um, is lower than the natural rate that would exist in a free pure free market so in a, so that, that is how uh, borrowing is highly subsidized now by the cheap by the cheap credit so one subsidy to real estate uh, is the uh, cheap credit, the financial subsidy. The other subsidy and the more important subsidy is the fact that governments spending on public goods and uh, a lot of other things uh, makes communities, makes locations more attractive and more productive, generating a higher rent. And because the public goods are paid for mostly by taxes on labor and capital and goods, that generates a subsidy to the owners of land because they're getting rent and land value generated by the public goods paid for by others. So that is the, the greatest subsidy. It's, it's implicit because it takes, takes the form not of cash, but of higher rent and land value. So subsidies, 
I've come to understand that subsidies are a greater problem than taxes. Subsidies are a worse intervention than taxes. Taxes impose a cost, but subsidies cause very high distortions. Let's see if there's another chat. Oh, for Matt Dodson, hi. If money is created when a loan is made, then is destroyed when a loan is repaid, what limits the amount of loans a bank can fund as the process does not draw down on the bank's capital? Well, but my understanding is that the process does draw down the bank's capital. The bank has required reserves, funds deposited that the bank keeps on hand, and the reserves beyond that, the money it holds beyond that is excess reserves and the bank loans out those excess reserves and they can only do that until the excess reserves are gone. So that is the drawing down of the bank's financial capital. Uh, unless uh, I'm missing something and that Dodson, if he wants to, can explain further. There is a drawdown of the excess reserves, right? Fred, um, my, the reason for my question is, while I accept what you say, I've never been able to understand the accounting treatment for it. Yeah, so, so there's a limit. In fact, if you take the required reserves ratio, the ratio of required reserves to total reserves, say it's 10%, uh, then the money that's created by loaning out my, uh, funds by the bank has a limit and that limit is uh, one divided by the required reserve ratio. So if the required reserves are 10% of total reserves, one divided by 0.1 is 10. So the maximum amount that the banks can increase the money supply is 10, right? The required reserves, the one divided by the required reserve ratio. All right, so um, now I'll move on to my uh, slides. So one of the things that is generating a uh, housing crisis where so much of housing is unaffordable and so many people can't afford uh, dwellings, right, are, is the restriction in the quantity supplied of housing. And there's a, there was a, article by Robin Harding in the Financial Times of 2008 that uh, went into that. So the book by Robin, the article by Robin Harding, Planning Rules Are Driving the Housing Crisis. You should be able to see the screen that says that. It says Econ 156 because uh, this, slide, this uh, file was generated by uh, a class I've been teaching at Santa Clara University on real estate economics. All right, so the cost of housing in big Western cities is one of the great economic and political problems of our age. From Sydney to Vancouver and San Francisco to pretty much anywhere in Southeast England, the cost of a place to live stops people moving to good jobs. It creates vast inequality between the young and the old, lowers the quality of life for millions. Over the past few years, the cost of these, the cause of these high costs has become more widely understood. Restrictive planning and zoning rules lead to a chronic lack of supply in the places where people want to live. So what is the housing supply? Some real estate analysts compare the number of houses with the number of households and find that in some places, the first number of houses has gone up relative to the second households. So since there's a growing excess of homes, they conclude there cannot be a shortage, but the sheer number of dwellings by itself is not the supply. It, it ignores location, quality, size, age, tenure, transport links, amenities, and everything else that matters to a house. Surprisingly enough in California, households exceed houses. So when you take a family home and divide it into poor quality leasehold bed sets, you sharply increase the number of dwellings, yet you reduce the amount of living space. At the same time, the number of households 
is not demand. As people become richer, they want bigger houses and quite a lot of them want second homes. So a family of five in a two bedroom flat is housed but not satisfied. Nor is a 20 something living in the parents basement who would rather have a place of one's own. So it's like the auto industry limiting output to one vehicle per household and then proclaiming there's no shortage because everybody has a car. So no matter whether a cow is a, a car is a 30 year old Trabant, Trabant was a Eastern European car that used to be made, I think in East Germany that was poor quality. So no matter if the car is a 30 year old Trabant, it constantly breaks down or costs a fortune. Supply has met demand. Congratulations, comrades. So rising vacancy rates are not necessarily what they seem. Paul Cheshire of the London School of Economics and colleagues have shown counterintuitively how tight supply leads to empty houses. Imagine a house that has become very expensive. Now you either have to find a rich buyer or get planning commission to convert it to flats. Both take time so the house sits empty. Lack of homes makes the market break down, pushing up vacancies, and then the vacancies are used to argue there's no lack of homes. So in contrast to simply counting houses, careful economic studies try to compare the cost of building to the cost of existing homes or the price of land with, with planning permission to that without it. Yes, that's a good point. One thing that you think need to think about on the price of land is land that has planning permission to that which does not. So uh, Edward Glazer and colleagues attributed half the cost of Manhattan apartments to planning rules. And uh, two economists found English house prices would have also been 35% lower in 2008 without these complex planning rules. There are plenty of legitimate things to say about the role of falling interest rates in pushing up house prices, the need for social housing, the scale of construction required to make a difference, and the use of houses as financial assets. Although noted is supply limits that make houses such good assets. What should not be in doubt is that supply limits are the single biggest problem with housing. Politicians often, often promise to build more homes, but really this is just counting houses again. It'll lead to small, low quality dwellings in places nobody wants them built to make up the numbers. Instead, reform the planning rules and let people build homes where they are actually wanted. Let me stop share at this point. See if there's a chat. Yeah, there's a chat. Okay, Marty Rowland. The money disappears when paid back to a bank. But if the smart borrower created something of wealth, there's a net increase in wealth out of thin air. No, it's not out of thin air. If somebody creates something, the wealth comes out of labor, right? And the use of land and capital goods. So I'm not sure what you mean. The, the borrowing is out of thin air, but the creation of wealth is not. It's not the government ownership of uh, most land in the UK, it's royal family owned. Oh, okay. It's uh, royal owned, but, but the, so who's paying the rent? Some of it is, um, Yeah, so if the if the if the crown owns the land, then um, who's getting the rent? The crown might be getting some of it, and but the rest would be obtained implicitly by the leaseholder. Didn't allowing big development in Hawaii lead to overbuilding? Uh, I'm not familiar with the Hawaii situation. Right, this is it. I, I just have a couple comments on the counting process. Because yeah. as you certainly know, people are really good at finding ways around regulations. Uh, 
Right. So, you know, I, I did a lot of work in metropolitan New York City and you go through uh, some of the city neighborhoods and every legal one family property has a rental apartment in the basement or attic. Every two legal two has a rental property somewhere to make it a three and every three or four and every four or five, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's, you know, I wonder how, um, how the, the, the counting process takes all that into consideration or if it does at all. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine it does uh, because those are those are legal dwelling units. Uh, no, they're not. They're, these oh, are, they're not. They're not oh, legal. Oh, 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 they're underground. Oh, yeah. Then, yeah. Then they. So. But we're uh, talking about we're talking about uh, I don't know what percentage of the housing stock in a in a in in many in some cities, but it can be fairly significant. You know. It, yeah. Yeah, that, that's true, and. Uh, but I'm not sure how, how they're counted, by whom. So you should be able to see the screen that says uh, business cycles, 63 business cycles. It's 63 because that was the number I was been using in my class. Yes. And uh, if you uh, want to look at the PowerPoint presentations, I have them in my website, uh, fulvery.net slash EC156 slash presentations. All right, so I've been talking about um, interest rates and time preferences, and I talked about also capital goods. And these concepts are derived from the Austrian School of Economic Thought. The predominant school of thought in England, Great Britain, in the 1800s was the classical school. And that is the school that uh, was uh, studied by uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, and in the mid 1800s, John Stuart Mill. Uh, but in Germany, there was a school of thought uh, called the historical school. And the, what the Germans said was that, don't look at abstract theory. Let's look at what people actually do in their everyday life. And then we can generalize from that. So it's called the historical school because they said, look, look to economic history and economic practice rather than abstract theorizing. Well, in Austria, which of course at that time was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Karl Menger uh, was a uh, professor there and he disagreed with the Germans and also he wanted to, he had ideas that were a little different from those of the British classical school. So he wrote a book called Principles of Economics uh, that was published in German, of course, in 1871. It wasn't translated into English until way later until 1950, but it influenced other economists of Austria. So it became uh, quite influential. Anyway, Karl Menger, had various elements of uh, thought that uh, became part in the Austrian school. He said that economic values are purely subjective. There's no intrinsic value in any good. Value depends on your taking an interest in something. Uh, another concept of Menger was uh, the use of marginal utility. Utility is the benefit and satisfaction we get from goods. The marginal utility is the benefit of an extra amount of good. And so that becomes important in economic analysis where the price is determined not by the total utility of something like water, but the marginal utility. Why is water so cheap? Because the marginal utility of an extra gallon is relatively low. After you've had enough water for drinking and bathing and washing dishes, right? The next best use of water, say, would be to water your garden, which has low value per gallon. And so therefore, that determines the price of, of water. And then uh, Menger emphasized the role of the entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are the drivers of economic progress. They organize production and innovate or bring innovations to market. Another aspect of the Austrian school is methodological individualism, that 
we in most analysis we start with the individual the individual consumer the individual entrepreneur or property owner and then see what what drives that person and then generalize to all people and then axiomatic deduction is the method of Carl Menger and also today's microeconomics where you start with certain premises such as scarcity and subjective values and you, dedu you deduce theory from that. Now one of the innovations of the Austrian school that was not absorbed into mainstream economics was the time structure of capital goods. And by time structure, I mean the duration of time that the good is productive. So inventory in a store turns over quickly. It has a short duration, uh, but say uh, real estate, construction and ownership of real estate has a very long duration. And the longer the duration, the more sensitive is that capital good and land to the rate of interest. Land, of course, has infinite du duration. So the key element in the Austrian school of business cycle theory is the relationship between the interest rate and the structure of capital goods. Low real interest rates, real interest rates uh, means adjusting for inflation. Low real interest rates induce investment in capital goods of long duration, as well as the purchase of associated land. High interest rates induce less investment in long duration capital goods and the purchase of associated land. So here's a graph that shows the, the market for loanable funds. The supply of loanable funds is that upward sloping curve and that comes from savings and money creation. And the demand is the demand to borrow money and where they intersect just like any other market, unless there's interference from government, it creates the market rate of interest without any interference and aside from any elements like risk it becomes the natural rate of interest. And the ultimate cause by of both the supply and demand for loanable funds is the time preference I talked about. All right, so the interest rate has a very important job or several jobs in the market. One is it equalizes savings and investment. How is that? Well, if you go up to the graph, uh, where the supply and demand intersect, the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied, right? So the quantity of borrowing equals the, the quantity of the supply of loanable funds. The interest rate also, number two, allocates production between consumption and economic investment. The interest rate sets the structure of investment in capital goods. It capitalizes income to asset value. That's the capitalization I talked about. And if, if we interfere with the natural, natural market rate of interest, the interest rate can't do its job anymore. It distorts and destabilizes these roles. And the result, we get economic problems like inflation, boom and bust, recession, economic waste. So much of what people loosely call interest is really non-interest debt service. When you have a credit card loan and they say, well, we're charging you 12%, only a little bit of that is really pure interest. Much of that is uh, due to uh, taxes. It's due to inflation. It's due to the risk of loaning it out when there's bad loans is due to the lender's overhead and normal profits. So the pure interest aside from any risk or inflation or taxes is what is paid to shift the purchase from the future to the present day aside from these non-time elements. So the effect, of, the effect of money creation is emphasized by the Austrian school when the monetary authority injects money into the banking system this increases bank reserves and lowers the transaction rate of interest. The investments are made in higher order capital goods, which later turn out to be 
bad investments as costs rise and profits, profits vanish. So an expansion of money creates an artificial boom, which becomes destabilizing as later prices rise, investment slows down, and the economy falls into a recession. Now, the real estate aspect is that one third of investment is related to real estate. And much of the long run investment is sensitive to the rate of interest uh, is the real estate. Much of the long run investment that is sensitive to the interest rate is in real estate. Speculative buying as to the demand for real estate construction and purchase. Much of the gains are based on capitalizing the value of public works and services. Tax advantages add to the price of real estate. Tax breaks are ultimately self-defeating. They don't help the new buyers because the price of land goes up to take advantage of the tax advantages. So the result then is an economic boom, an unsustainable upward spiral. The low rate of interest also capitalizes up the value of real estate, the land value. Real estate owners have more equity, so they borrow more on that equity. It's an upward spiral that's unsustainable as the price rent, rent ratio of real estate rises, the price first, uh, relative to the rent. And as households and enterprises can less afford to buy or even rent real estate. Now the problem recently has been made worse by the secondary mortgage market. And maybe Ed Dodson can tell us more about that. But uh, the, the secondary mortgage market is when a government sponsored enterprises nicknamed Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and others, they buy mortgages from banks. So a bank like say Bank of America makes a mortgage loan. It sells that loan in the secondary market to these enterprises, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and others. So loans secured by real estate still have some risk. It's costly to repossess and real estate prices can fall. Uh, so the banks are happy to sell the mortgage to the secondary market. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they sell bonds in order to raise funds to buy mortgages. And the interest income from mortgages, right, is less than the interest, well, used to be, uh, nowadays the interest paid on bonds is, is low, so uh, this no longer holds. But the bank can then make another loan. It sells the loan and then it can make another loan. It keeps doing that and it earns fees when it's doing that, so it's profitable. So a lot of, now land rent is about a third of total income. So how come we don't see it in the official accounts? because a lot of the rent becomes paid as interest. Land rent on a house gets paid as mortgage interest to banks or to Fannie Mae, which gets paid as bond interest to a bondholder. In the national income accounts, it gets counted as interest. And that can continue as long as real estate owners don't default. The Fannie and Freddie have also been packaging mortgages into guaranteed mortgage backed securities bought by insurance companies, pension funds, mutual funds, and so on. So that happened prior to the depression of 2008. And because uh, of the recession that affected the whole world, um, these um, packaged mortgages turned out to be bad investments that couldn't pay their, their interest anymore. And so that affected the financial industry, insurance companies, pension funds, mutual funds, brokerage firms, and so on. So if a lot of homeowners default, the government sponsored enterprises are in trouble. They get less income to pay their bonds and they have to pay interest on the guaranteed bonds. The result is the domino series of defaults. The homeowner defaults on his mortgage, GSEs on their bonds, the insurance companies have losses and their account holders have losses. The whole economy is vulnerable. 
to a big fall in real estate prices and defaults on mortgage payments. That was made worse with because of subprime loans as the boom moves towards its peak, lending standards get looser to make more loans. And since they're bought up by government sponsored enterprises, banks lend more to subprime borrowers, those with greater credit risks, uh, practice promoted also by government. The banks borrow 80%, the, the buyers borrow 80% or more on houses with high prices. Their mortgage payments are a high percentage of their income. And they have adjustable rate mortgages, which increase with rising interest rates. They default at a higher rate and they're more likely to lose their jobs at a downturn. So to summarize, the real estate boom is spurred by tax advantages, capitalization of public works, low interest rates due to monetary expansion and the secondary market for mortgages. So when real estate crashes, interest rates uh, and real estate prices uh, then fall, the economy goes into a recession, uh, people default, institutions fail, and then what happens? The government bails out the financial sector. So the policies issues that we could discuss is, is the business cycle natural or inevitable, or is it created by the government policy that I described? Can the boom bust cycle be eliminated? If so, what policies would eliminate it? So that's the end of that.